Hello, good afternoon. This is um, Dr. Sasha Jovanovic, um, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you back to an, uh, a live one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion um, session, which today we have with um, one of my uh, very, very uh, long-term colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Joseph Khan. It's my uh, pleasure really to have Joe here in this session because um, uh, as we all know we're working in really unpresented times and uh, Joe you uh, and me we have really I think probably been affected by this uh, as much as anybody because we have such a busy and active educational life, uh, practice life, and research life and of course everything has been put upside down so I really um, look forward to working with you in this next hour and I welcome you to uh, this platform Joe great to see you great to see you Sasha you're looking good my friend <laughs> I like the European style uh, you know N95 that's that's the one I have the Asian style N95 by the way oh really it's been a little bit crazy you know, I, I can never imagine we're not doing dentistry. You know, I, I, I actually had a dream the other day. I did a sinus graph on someone, okay? I had a dream, you know. But, but you know what interesting me enough is it gives us time to reflect, okay? It slows us down. Get, you know, reflect about life, what's going on. You know, I actually learned how to cut my own hair now. <laughs> how do you like my new hairstyle? I cut my own hair now. That's good. Well, yeah, that looks good. I, 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 I have not tried that yet, so I'm just uh, using a lot of gel and putting it all behind my ears. <laughs> so, Joe, yeah, I know um, probably like a lot of people who are watching us right now, um, they're interested to, uh, to know how your life has been affected maybe for a few minutes. Uh, we have a very uh, important topic, um, you know, um, of course, which everybody wants to know, extraction sockets and immediate tooth replacement. But um, maybe just give us a little bit, because you know, you're based at the university, at Loma Linda University, one of the most important uh, implant universities uh, worldwide. I um, you know, respect uh, the university. I'm a faculty there as well, and I've learned there, so I'm really appreciative. But what does that, um, how did that affect you and the students? I mean, uh, and what are they doing right now? Are they all learning now also online? And when are they going back to school? Right. Well, everything is online. You know, of course, no clinical work. So, you know, everything is basically based on the Zoom platform. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. Actually, we are, as teachers, we are learning a different way to teach. And uh, I actually commit to a lot of graduate students. They actually enjoy this a lot. They enjoy this a lot. I believe this event's going to change the way not only we do dentistry, but the way we do continue education in the future. All right. I mean, I think that a lot of um, future big meetings, the big, big conferences, I believe will be somewhat compromised mm -hmm. because a lot of things more and more will go online. And of course, with the travel restrictions and things like that. But the students are hanging in there. I mean, they're the troopers, they're great, great people. And they're resilient. You know, we will only come up, come back stronger. We know that. Okay. And tell me, um, you and I, we've had a very active uh, worldwide education schedule. And of course, it was almost normal for us to, uh, to uh, you know, be on a uh, plane somewhere like around the world, uh, jetting to a symposium or to give a training course. If it wasn't weekly, it was for sure bi-weekly. Um, now you've been home, I suppose, like what, for like almost three months or two months plus. Um, how did that affect you kind of as a person? And how do you see the rest of the year? And uh, do you see going back to this active traveling lifestyle? Or do you maybe think also personally um, you're going to do this differently? Well, uh, great question. All my, pretty much all my lectures this year, has been either canceled or will be canceled. In fact, some of the early part of next year, a lot of the conferences actually contacted me. They, they put a big question mark. Because the reality is until there's a vaccine, I don't think we are brave enough to do that. 
I mean, our life is not not is too precious to 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 die for just a trip somewhere. Okay, so is it gonna change me? Um, absolutely. As I told you, Sasha, time give us you know give us this time to reflect. You know, I mean, is it, what is important in our life? I mean, is is doing you know sixty implants and you know uh, publishing another sixteen articles? Is it really gonna change it? So uh, what this talk to me is this, I've actually learned to even give even more, all right? Uh, I mean, education is, uh, 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 using the Zoom platform, I believe that we can really uh, reach out education all globally and, uh, and, and maybe even travel a little bit less. That's how I see myself right now. Okay. Yeah, I think like, you know, from my perspective, it's the same way. Um, of course, I have an... Um, a few extra years ahead of you. Um, so I can say like I've traveled a few extra years than you. And I certainly like, you know, I'm reflecting on this here to be more careful and also to utilize, of course, um, a very effective online uh, communication like we're doing today, for example. You can see how uh, the Guide Institute, which we created about 15 years ago, uh, was born kind of on this digital platform. We were maybe a little bit ahead of time but uh, now, uh, it, after 15 years, it really turned around that we can see that this is maybe a new educational world that we're going to be entering in. And uh, we well, will adjust and, um, and work together. Absolutely way ahead of time. Yeah. I believe, if I remember right, you may be the first group that, that, that pushed for this. Right. I mean, you were really brave at that time, but at that time, it's just... You know, not a very certain investment, but, but it turned out to be, that's really the future. Right. And you can see there after many groups kind of follow, I'm going to use the term, follow your footsteps. So you definitely are a pioneer in not just in guidable regeneration, but you are a pioneer in, in digital education. Absolutely. Congratulations, Sasha. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's been done with, you know, collaboration with many people around the world. I remember like 15, 17 years ago, people in Japan waking up at two o'clock in the morning to see an online lecture. <laughs> it was like a lot of fun. So, okay, well, um, this is a great introduction just for everybody to know that like, um, you know, your uh, colleagues and uh, uh, like Dr. Joseph Kahn and myself were affected in the same way like you. We're trying to start our practice now slowly. We're reopening and we are dealing with the same uh, protective measurements that that's really difficult but we're implementing this in our office to be, of course, safe with the staff, um, with the uh, um, patients, and with ourselves, the doctors. So uh, we're all in it together, and I think, as Joseph, you said, we'll come out of it stronger. So let's go now to our topic. I mean, it's a topic which, of course, um, uh, is a topic which is one of our favorite topics. Uh, how do we can um, treat patients effectively efficiently and also how can we get patients to accept our dental implant therapy in an as uh, good as possible way uh, with a high efficiency. So immediate tooth replacement of course has been on the forefront now for probably a good 20 years. Um, and um, so tell us Joe like you know when you started your whole research I would say almost empire of immediate tooth replacement because it's like a pyramid and it's just like the base is getting wider and wider and wider. I mean, it's, um, you know, you have done such an enormous job there. Um, how did you uh, really enter into this research of immediate tooth replacement? And then um, how did like, you know, the first days really look, of course, extremely different than what you're doing today? So maybe give us like the first steps that you made. And then, of course, also like that giant leap forward. To where you are today, which is so efficient and aesthetically so satisfying. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the kind words, Sasha. I I don't think I have invented anything, you know, or being originated in anything in research. I mean, whatever I do, basically, I either get the idea from someone, I either you know like modify it a little bit, and I I'm lucky enough to publish it. Or maybe, you know, I, I get the ideas from, from the classical period and post literature. So on immediate implant placement, how I get started is I'm really blessed that when I first started my residency in the, you know, like mid-1990s, and you remember in those days, I mean, 
I remember early 1990s, you, I mean, you already a, a big superstar, you remember. I mean, you were, the, the, your big topic is perimentitis, remember? Right. And then GDR, you know, you're building, book regenerating around the implants. I mean, you, I mean, you were the big guys there, but you remember, but in that time, early on, early 1990s, implants aesthetic is not there yet. You remember that. I mean, you know, I mean, we will focus on perimetime titles, but, but aesthetic is not there. And probably around 1995 plus or minus, people will start focusing more on aesthetics, right? Soft tissue managed around implant. And that's where immediate tooth replacement start, start coming into play. And then I believe uh, Peter Worley was the first truly person, and you right. know Peter, first published that, and he is, he is basically buried. And, and, and how I get into this is because before he published this concept of immediate tooth replacement, even before he, he half of this idea, he was actually a faculty like yourself in our Loma Linda program. And I was a young graduate student. So indirectly, he, he planted a seed in my mind about aesthetics and implants. And so, uh, of course, early on when we do immediate tooth replacement, it makes sense. I mean, shorter treatment time, patients are happy, don't need to wear a denture. I mean, it's amazing, right? Right away, they, they see something, and on top of that, support the gingival architecture. But the thing is, that's how we start, but of course, you know, immediate tooth replacement have been so controversial, right? You remember those days that I'm sure you are also one of the pioneers who does that, and people probably criticize you, just as much they criticize me, they think we are like the, 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 the cowboys doing crazy stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And then it took years, look at that, more than two decades. Now I believe you know you in the lecture circuit, and you can share with me a lot of those hardcore people who are against this concept, who 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 who, who just think that it's crazy. They are secretly or they are starting to do it themselves, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe you can come a little bit because that history is very important for the young students out there because they think everything is validated right away. It takes decades. I mean, you remember those days, Sasha. Yeah, no, I mean, like, you know, we always uh, say, like, the, the master uh, who has, like, tried to come up with, like, a new technique or a new indication or a new protocol has failed many more times uh, to come up with this new protocol than a student or a normal person has ever tried. So, you know, those of us who have worked hard to change a paradigm or, like, to make something new, of course, are very um, we're aware of this. It takes a long time. So, um, okay, well, that's a great um, introduction, I think, for us to know that, like, this has been really a an, an topic which has been evolving for over 20 years. Now, I know, like, you know, for you, um, in the early days, of course, when you were developing this here and co-developing with, of course, other groups, is um, the diameter of an implant the type of an implant was really more important than really actually uh, preserving uh, tissues with maybe with grafts, etc. So what did you kind of learn in those early days of like, for example, diameters that you absolutely would not do, of course, today anymore? Uh, maybe type of implants, what, would you, uh, what are you looking for in an implant? And then, of course, um, where you switched over to grafting, are we looking at bone grafting? Are we looking at soft tissue grafting? Or are we looking at maybe a combination of both? So maybe give us kind of a little perspective on that and um, uh, that would be helpful. So basically, implant diameter-wise, I mean, I need to reference you two publications. First of all, 1998, that's the first publication on immediate tooth replacement I mentioned to you, Peter Worley. The second reference I want to reference you is in 2001, the journal is Compendium, Compendium. The office is, uh, first author is David Garber, then Marilis and Henry Salah. So both articles at that time when they talk about immediate tooth replacement and implant diameter, first of all, Peter Worley, he mentioned that your implant should fill the, fill the socket. Not only that, he mentioned that if the socket is bigger than the implant, then your implant should be pushed buckly, contacting the buckle plate to hold the buckle plate. Then you look at Salama, David Garber and Salama brothers in, in, in 2001, the Atlanta team, when they published an article, they, likewise, they say that in the most ideal situation, an implant should fill the socket. 
Now, of course, you know, I mean, we, you know, we as clinicians, we follow a lot of those rules, and I'm sure I don't know whether you have experienced that. Now, I look back of those cases. I mean, I hope those patients won't come back and look for me. <laughs> they are nightmares. No bomb, no tissue, crazy situation. So then we learn. Then you know, later on, you know, like 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 almost seven, six, seven, seven, eight years later, I mean, my dear friend John Coyce and I, and you are also one of the first people. I remember your article when you were back in UCLA Times. You mentioned, uh, I think your group and my group of John Coyce were the first one to mention smaller diameter implant actually is the key. Okay, why? Because we realize the buckle bone is going to remodel. Uh, you all, we all learn about the bundle bone from Jan Lindy's, uh, you know, those the, the beagle dog studies. But the reality is this, we know, every time when we extract the, sock, the tooth from the socket, after we put implant in there, if we do not leave a gap between the implant and the buckle bone, and we know that that buckle bone, because of lack of the support from the tooth and the bundle bone, is going to be model. And if we don't leave a gap, the impact is going to be exposed. So going back to the gap and graph management, the second question you asked, I mean, when the purpose for me to leave a gap and a small diameter implant, just like you say in your literature, is to actually to, pre, to, to compensate for that inherent remodeling of that buckle complex. And, and how much does it come remodel? Of course, different patients remodel differently. But in general, based on the literature that we all have, we, the upper limit is probably 1.5 millimeters. That means if you extract the tooth, you put bone graft in the gap, you know, after the remodeling, the upper limit is probably a little bit 1.5. Therefore, if you leave a gap up there, less than 1.5 to 2 more meters, you can risk exposing that people. Uh, in terms of graft material-wise, and I, I mean, I have my opinions, you are the expert in GPR. In bone, I mean, you, you are the, 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 the godfather of regeneration. You know that. <laughs> I mean, I will tell you that for me, when I put bone graft material in the gap, I basically, um, for me, I like to prefer to give a combination of 50-50% of xenograft and allograft. Now, of course, in the United States, in the States, we, we are allowed to use allograft. A lot of countries cannot use you know, allograft or xenograft. So, if that situation, if you can maybe scrape some of collagen's bone and do a mixture, maybe that's, that works best. We did a study. We, we compare like like you know, the data on them. when you use xenograft and allograft on the gap. Allograft tends to retract a little bit more than xenograft. And so I prefer to have some xenograft component in it. I mean, what, what do you do, uh, I mean, Sasha? I mean, you, again, you are very also experienced. What kind of material do you use? Uh, if you leave a gap, what size gap do you want, you should prefer to leave? Yeah, so that's a good question. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Joe. Like for me, uh, it's been always like an, uh, a very important part that, as you said, the implant diameter is limited. So like usually my implant diameter is in the anterior maxilla is maybe 3.5, 3.75. It will pretty much never go over that 4.0. I mean, really like uh, that's seldom. So I create a gap like you suggested of about a millimeter and a half plus or minus. And then, of course, I make sure that I have the buckle plate intact. Uh, the uh, buckle bone has to be intact to me within about a three millimeter apical distance from the gingival margin. So then I know that basically that whole facial plate is intact. Now that gap, I then fill normally if it if the full buckle plate is intact with xenograft only, and uh, this is sufficient for me in like now twenty plus years. Because I make sure, and that's my inclusion criteria for immediate tooth replacement, that that buckle bone is intact. Because I see that buckle bone almost like an, a biological, bioactive membrane. Because it has the periosteum coming in from the uh, facial. It has bone, which of course is thin, but it's still there. And then the xenograft just preserves the whole area. Um, you mentioned for a moment, like, you know, the autogenous. Um, that I do as well. I usually do that more like in patients maybe who have like a, a more missing bone or like the bones are really thin. Or of course, when I switch over to GBR completely, that's when I start to add autogenous bone. So what, what does that mean for me? I, I take immediate tooth replacement out of the context if I'm missing buckle bone. And that's when I switch over to an, a GBR where we start to use xenograft and autograft. 
Oh, that's a great point, Sasha. I mean, that concept for me, I differ from you a little bit. Okay, I differ from you a little bit because based on our more the last maybe 10, well, 13, 14 years of research, we noticed that the buckle plate. I mean, ideally, is to have the buckle plate intact where, intact where we do immediate implant placement. But the last 15 years of research seems to suggest to us if we put implant placement in a socket in which the buckle won't be somewhat compromised. All right? And let me define what do I mean by compromise. So if you look at the middle, mid, mid distal width of the tooth and how wide is that defect, all right? Uh, we noticed that as long as the defect the although it's present, it doesn't encompasses the interbone of the interpoxal teeth, the adjacent teeth. If we place implant in, and we can get good stability, and occlusally, the implants are placed within the defect, we notice we, by doing GPI and soft tissue graft, we actually have excellent tissue aesthetics. Uh, in fact, the Dennis Tarnell group also, also published a similar article, it's also acetate you know, uh, uh, similar concepts there. And then my friend, and uh, you may know her, she's a wonderful periodontist, Dr. Chai in Malaysia, and she's also starts showing some data on that. So I think ideally for beginners, I agree with you, buckle plate will be tapped. But after you have done a bunch of cases, you start getting, you know, provision on it, we can venture out a little bit now, just with smaller defects, not like big buckle bone defects, but small defects, we can still get very efficient results. Okay. Um, we can come back to this discussion because it's always interesting for me um, when we plan patients for immediate tooth replacement based on comb beam CT scans and careful aesthetic analysis. Of course, things can go wrong. I mean, even in the best families, you know, we get once in a while a problem. So we can maybe come back to that discussion in a moment because there's going to be these moments where we can't do it. Uh, but let's continue on the soft tissue graph because I also know from your research and from you know working for a long time together with you that in the early days of course you were not really working so um, or you were not so focused on soft tissue grafts but now when I look at your work over certainly the last years I, I, I think I've never seen you do or present an immediate tooth replacement with an aesthetic outcome that you have not done uh, a soft tissue graft and so maybe give us a little bit on that and then specify on the soft tissue graft um, which is always the question from uh, from many clinicians are you talking right. like a, taking a sub epithelial graft are you taking a tuberosity graft uh, or are you maybe even like venturing into like some of the soft tissue alternatives which are on the market now okay so great point so going back to the issue graft, you are correct initially probably the first five years I when I do immediate implant placement, tissue graft wasn't even in the equation. In fact, I believe you are probably the first person who published on the anterior situation. I believe it was a PPAD. Remember that? Right. That you show implant and GBR. And I think that's the first time, I believe. Right. Okay. Although it's not a study, that's the first time I've seen that. So, you know, like I said, you are some of the people that plan to in my mind. And I say, all right, that, that makes sense to me. Because if you look at natural teeth, um, if the teeth, the teeth is thin, high chance of recession, when that happens to implants too. And when I look back to my cases of thin teeth, absolutely high chances. Under such circumstances, that's why I say, all right, there's time to do tissue craft. Let's see whether it works or not. So in 2004, probably around, what, two, three years after your first publication, I started really pushing on the tissue craft, started doing research on it. And um, not only just to see the clinical outcome, the aesthetic scores, but I look at, can we achieve certain tissue thickness? One of our co-workers, Dr. Kidd, you know him, and that he did the study, you know, we published an article on JPRD looking at when we do tissue graft, we indeed actually thicken the soft tissue around implants. So, and then consistently thereafter, we notice that the benefit of tissue graft. And uh, it not only can thicken up the tissue for aesthetics, moreover, it can minimize the recession. So that's great. Now, where do we harvest the soft tissue graft from? And what techniques do we use? Because let's talk about the approach. In general, there are three ways to approach to do a tissue graft on the facial aspect of the implant. You need a razor flap, all right? Like what Sukelim, our friend Sukeli does, just raise a flap, 
You put a tissue graph, suture around it, and close. That's one way. Another way is to do flatless and tunnel it. We call that like a bilaminar approach. Just create a pouch on the facial aspect of the tube and slide a tissue graph in. The third approach, I like to call it the scarf technique, like a scarf. What we do is we take a, a, a strip of tissue and then pack it on the right below the free gingival margin, between the free gingival margin to the bone, and circumferential like a scarf from interpulsal area to interpulsal area. So those are the three major ways to 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 harvest a tissue graph. I mean to to paste a tissue graph. Now yeah. is there one way that I prefer? To be honest, I mean the easiest way is to is do the scarf, and the results are actually pretty amazing. But if any patient that I feel that I really need to bulk up the tissue, I would I will not hesitate to do it either way so far, but do a tunnel. Now, where we have a cigar graft, as you mentioned, in my book, there are three ways. Either from the tuberosity, from the lateral palate, and lateral palate, the approach is to a single stroke incision. I think you does a, you do the same thing and do a half of what you call a sub epithelial connective tissue graft. Or I harvest it from the palate, but farther back towards the molar region. And the way I harvest tissue graft in the molar region, now you say, whoa, the greater palate is there. But the way I harvest it is, I call it like the Sukali method, okay? You know, we, I just take a free tissue graft and deapiphilize it. Mm -hmm. How do I harvest tissue graft from a tuberosity? Same. I do a deapiphilized tuberosity graft. So how do I do that? I take the number 12 blade, and then I take it back to the hammer lodge, and I just do an anterior stroke, and I just get a piece, this piece of tissue. It's almost like a posterior pocket reduction, then I get a peripheralizing. So which way is the best? I had a good discussion with Kelly like two weeks ago, all right? And honestly, you and me have done a lot of subperfilial connective tissue. Right? I mean, you know, you look at your cases, and you are an excellent surgeon. I look at your cases, not every tissue graph you place is just like, just like a white piece of fiber tissue. No, there are many cases I see you, there's some, you know, like, like, like fatty tissue left oh, yeah. behind. It's just the way life is. But yet, when I look at those cases that have some fatty tissue left behind, the results a lot of times look very good too. Mm -hmm. You know, you have very good results. So I don't think we absolutely need absolute fibrotic tissue to get that optimal result. I don't think so. And I want to hear from you in a minute. Let me just finish my statement. Now, but the thing is this though, if we get tissue more fibrotic, definitely from tuberosity and from the molar region that you deapiphilize, it looks clean, cleaner, and then you can kind of, you know, like, like suture really nice, okay, because it's less frail. But one, one unique advantage I noticed is this. I'm doing a follow-up on a bunch of cases comparing th these three types of graph, soft tissue graph. And what we look at is, does it proliferate? You know, sometimes when you do some soft tissue yeah. crisis, it actually expands. You know that. And I want to hear from you. So what I notice is this. When we have a tissue from the mole, uh, tuberosity and uh, the epithelialized area from the molar area, we notice that there's a higher chance of proliferation compared to when you have from the lateral palate. I mean, I want to hear from you. What, what's your experience? Is it similar or is it different, Sasha? Um, you know, for um, let me first say, like, you know, when you mentioned the uh, placement of the connective tissue graft, um, for the purpose of the topic of today, which is immediate tooth replacement, I have come to really strongly um, um, appreciate what you call the, the scarf technique. Because what I've noticed is when you have a buccal bone which is intact and you have placed your implant more palatally and you have filled the gap with the graft of choice, which in my case would be a xenograft, then really the only thing that you need to support is actually the tissue which is supracrestal. And what we also have is um, we actually have um, the abutment and we're going to hopefully still come to discuss that which is kind of has this concave um, kind of emergence so you actually are creating space for soft tissue that's what you call scarf tissue to just be mechanically locked into it 
So sometimes I do these um, connective tissue graft techniques like the scarf technique and I don't even place a suture because it's already locked into place. Another thing I want to add to your, um, I think, very good summary of the palatal tissues, I can definitely uh, support that, is that sometimes I get away with, but you know, I have to have a little bit thicker tissue, to take like a semi-lunar approach of the palatal tissue from the implant site, because sometimes the palatal area can be really nice and thick. And then I don't need to go to the tuberosity, I don't need to go anywhere, and I can just place that directly. And um, I mean, believe it or not, it's kind of, kind of funny, because uh, some patients are coming back for treatment. So yesterday, I did do an immediate tooth replacement. I wish we could have injected it right here into our conversation. And uh, there I actually um, uh, did a scarf, uh, scarf technique, and I just took it from the palatal side of that implant. Now, when, um, when you just discussed like the, um, uh, you know, the, the connective tissue graft and what I published, it was, I believe it was in 1997, that PPAD article that you mentioned. Um, so what you will see there is actually, I'm doing that for the delayed implant placement. So for those cases which have no buccal bone. So there I switched around to now make the decision. I'm doing an implant into an extraction site which has no bone the soft tissue is thin so for me to do everything at the same time a gbr graft and to do a closure with the flap to really preserve that closure as optimal as possible i need soft tissue so in those cases i really like the sub epithelial graft and i'll tell you why joe because you you mentioned that nicely is about the fatty tissue because when you go more and take a strip graft or like you call it the zucchelli technique where you go on the surface and you have this dense fibrotic tissue, it's kind of almost like a, a plywood. It's like so dense. You can't really place it nicely in a three-dimensional way over a membrane site, around teeth, etc. So I like the subepithelial graft because it has fibroblasts, it has keratinocytes. Yeah, maybe it has some fatty tissue, but it's all going to be covered anyway with the flap. So it's really nice. So, and um, I have seen this to work really well over the last 20 plus years in GBR sites, which I did with resorbable, so native collagen membranes, and in cases where I had to also reconstruct a vertical dimension, and I used a titanium-reinforced uh, PTFE membrane. And both of those do the same thing with the connective tissue grafts. As long as the connective tissue graft is stable, I close it with the flap, it's, it, it gets its vascularization. So, um, Absolutely. I, yeah. I agree, Sasha. I want to ask you a question. I mean, what is your view on those non-autogenous soft tissue graft, you know, uh, on, on, on non-autogenous tissue grafts. Right. What, what do you think about using them? Do you use them at all? Yeah, so th it's a good question that you're asking because I get that question all the time whenever I do like uh, a soft tissue uh, uh, course or training course. Um, so here, here's my, my uh, view on this. If you're looking at allografts, so human dermal grafts, I would say they're very risky because, you know, from a standpoint of like placing them, it's really like uh, non-vascularized, of course. It's kind of uh, has been chemically modified to just take off all the proteins and everything out of that site. And it's kind of, an, you know, semi uh, not clean graft. So those I definitely do not recommend and I don't use them. The collagen grafts, which are on the market, especially the native collagen grafts, which are on the market, they have a much more cleaner approach. They're like, you know, very biologically accepted by the body. And of course, uh, you can use them very, very efficiently uh, as a potentially soft tissue alternative. The only problem, of course, they have is they don't create any space and they don't really create like, you know, volume or keratinization. Unless you can combine them again in a hybrid fashion with some type of soft tissue graft from the palate. So the latest generation, which now has been brought out a few years ago, is like an, uh, a collagen graft, which has like a very minor amount of chemical um, cross-linking in it. So the inflammatory response is minimal. Those are showing a much better volume uh, dimensional stability. Um, and those are kind of, you know, presented by, uh, you know, one of our online sponsors, like Geislick, a fiber guide. 
but of course, you know, we have to wait and see how they will do over time because it's still like, you know, about three plus years in the follow-up. But those will probably be more for volume. Again, they don't really show keratinization, but that's maybe. But until we clarify all this here, of course, my go-to soft tissue graft, as it is probably in your practice, is still going to be the autogenous soft tissue graft. Absolutely, I agree. But just one quick question. In today, when you do an anterior immediate, will you use fibroglide? Will you hesitate to use fibroglide to try to thicken up the facial tissue in substitution of the autogenous tissue? Um, so for the immediate tooth replacement, I'm, that's what you're asking, right? For immediate tooth replacement? Yes. Um, yes. I probably will still stick to the connective tissue graft. Um, also because, like, you know what, my my connective tissue graft harvesting is so minimally invasive and you know I do appreciate very much the keratinocytes and the fibroblast. The part where I like to use the soft tissue alternatives like like a fiber guide is uh, when I'm dealing with like um, implant cases which are solidly in bone so I don't need to like really depend on that little thin buccal plate to survive so they're already in solid bone but they have this concavity where like I just need some extra volume and so it's a much safer area so I'm building myself up for like you know allowing that to be like uh, you know in a more predictable setting right away so that's kind of where my my indication is yeah okay I, I go back to you now Joe okay you asked me a couple of questions so let's go to um, to ask you I know like you know you you're focusing of course on immediate and we're focusing a lot on that um, what is like probably from your standpoint right now, what, what are the mistakes and the complications that you have seen, not 20 years ago, because you know, those, you know, we all have when we're developing a technique and we're researching a technique, but what do you see now when you're looking at all your students, when you're looking at all your clinical uh, colleagues around the world who are asking you all these questions and probably sending you iPhone photos and WhatsApp uh, messages, oh, please help me. What do you see that most people make a mistake with? And what do you see the most complications that you face? Well, honestly, nowadays, you know, surprisingly, even when I look at my graduate students, you know, when they do immediate tooth replacement, or even from outside power practice, the doctors communicate with me, the, the, the concept of immediate tooth replacement, thanks to many people, it is so, it is, you know, pretty solid now. You know what I mean? The guidelines are very solid, you know. So if you follow the guidelines, actually it works pretty, pretty good. And to be honest, nowadays the biggest question or complications that when people call, communicate with me, when they do anterior immediate tooth replacement is when they put a piece of root shield mm -hmm. around the socket. That is probably the biggest question mark with a lot of people that, that you know, more than, because the, the, the concept of placing an implant, how to place it, how deep, how small, how big is pretty mature, but that that shield there, and I'm sure you probably heard a lot about that too. With that shield, suddenly now we start facing complications. I have complications. You know, I have people start calling me a lot. What to do? What what should we do? Should we even do it? So that's where I said, if you ask me, I don't know. Do you feel the similar type of concerns now about the shield? Yeah, I mean, I I always get like the question about the shield for sure, um, and like. My answer is just towards the shield, like I say, like, look, from having like a long-term experience with immediate tooth replacement, which I consider to be stable, but, you know, we use a very careful selection criteria again. Um, I think the shield is a very comfortable um, biological protocol for me to know that it can work. We don't have like, you know, at the same time, no five-year or 10-year follow-ups on this. So, you know, let's, let's face that. Um, I, have do, I do have some cases which are older, so they're approaching the 10 years, and they look to be very stable. But what I like about the socket shield technique is, like, I usually will not go into it like, okay, I'm going to do today an immediate tooth replacement, I'm going to do socket shield. No. I will use that biological protocol to when I remove a tooth, and, like, sometimes, as we all know, these teeth come out in many pieces, and I know that, like, there's one root behind, or, like, two root pieces behind, I'm not nervous right I don't, i'm not nervous because i know from the from the results that we've had early on from the scandinavian teams around neiman etc 
and of course later on Hertzler, etc., that like, you know, it can work. So I don't usually uh, prep or plan a case for socket shield. That is, that is actually very interesting. And I think focus shield for me, I mean, people often ask for me, I don't think I really intentionally leave a, leave a piece of shield on the facial just to maintain the buckle bone because as we have shown already, bone grafting, the gap, tissue grafting, contour grafting, I mean, look at your cases, look at our cases, look actually most of the time great. It may not be as perfectly maintained just like when you leave a shield, you know, because you have an extracted tooth. But in my opinion, it's too technique sensitive to go that route. That's my two cents. However, I remember I saw a case of your Sasha long time ago. You put a shield, I think, between two implants. Right. Remember that? Yes. How did that case? That was more than seven, eight years now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that case turn out, Sasha? That case is really, um, I mean, I wish I could pull it up right now on the screen, but that's, that's, uh, was a case which was done on an, uh, uh, one of our Los Angeles patients and that's approaching actually 10 years and um, at the current time uh, Francesco Mitroni in Italy is actually pulling together a couple of older cases or five plus years and that patient is in there so that patient is totally stable and he had one like uh, a ceramic chipping on the on the crown but from a tissue standpoint and interproximal tissues it's like really very stable so, uh, so the key, yeah. my key point, Sasha, is the, the benefit of the shield especially is more on inter implant situations. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, but that, that's a great, great, great benefit. And you did a publication on that. Mm. Of course, like also to make a decision, how, what do you do when you have a case that you planned for immediate tooth replacement and now the buckle bone is not there, right? So do you go then to a, maybe a socket graft or do you still try to like go forward an implant placement? Are you ready for that GBR? And also psychologically, how do you prepare the patient? Do you tell them already in the consultation phase, hey, I'm ready to give you a beautiful tooth, but remember this is live tissue, so I cannot always control it. So give us a little bit of your experience there. Okay, so Sasha, I think first of all, Diagnosis is extremely important. That means to make sure you understand the socket morphology before you even proceed with the procedure. In other words, at least in my experience over my career, I don't remember, maybe even if there is, there may be only one situation in which when I plan for an immediate tooth replacement, when I extract the tooth, I find out that Oops, I cannot do it, you know, and, and, and based on the reason because the bone morphology was not diagnosed correctly, all right? So how do we make the diagnosis? Uh, bone sounding helps. CBCD scan to a certain degree helps. Why did I say that? Because we all know with CPT, CBCD scan, looking at sagittal cut, if the buckle plate is not thick, that means maybe one millimeter or less, the chance sometimes of not seeing it on the CBCD scan is high. So we got to be very careful with that diagnosis. I use a combination of scan as well as careful bone sounding, sometimes more than at one point, not just facially, mid facially, to ascertain the presence or absence of the buckle plate. Pyro, I even go in there. So have I gone into a situation in which I plan for immediate tooth replacement and I cannot do it. Yes, I have, but honestly, in under at least under my hands, we're talking about definitely way, way, way less than 0.001% chance. I, I don't even remember for, I, I can, I'm very sure less than two handful of cases in my career that I planned it and I cannot execute it. And most of the time, the reason I cannot execute it is because I was not able to attain good primary stabilization. Okay. That's the reason, and that is a spinner. So I cannot achieve that. And, and honestly, it's way, way, way less than two handful, okay? Maybe barely over one handful. So going back to my point, what happens if I plan for a case in which I know the buckle bone is compromised? What should I do? Do I do GBR now? Or do I go in there and do a socket graft? Or do I still go for it? It, it, it implant placement. 
like I say, for me, maybe because I have been on this for quite some years now, doing this type of procedure, so I'm familiar. So again, if there's a defect, a coupon defect, I first ask myself, how wide is the defect, all right? How, how deep is the defect? If the defect width is what we call a narrow, like a little V-shaped defect like that, it doesn't bother me at all, okay? This is wider like this, it still doesn't bother me, but if the width of the defect is so wide that it damages or it compri comprises the interpartial bone of the adjacent teeth, that's when I don't go for it. So what that means is V-shape or a little bit wider usually defect, I will plan, I can still plan for immediate impact placement provided, provided. Three important rules. Rule number one, there's enough bone for me to attain very good impact stabilization. Now, how much bone do I need? Minimally 35% of the impact should be engaged onto the bony socket. Rule number two, occlusally, if you see, let's say, you know, you see my fingers are the defect. So this is a complete buckle plate. This is like a defect there. Provided if the defect, when I put the implant in, the implant is within the defect, encompasses by the defect. All right? So that's rule number two. So rule number three is there should be interpartial bone. So if there's interpartial bone, good enough for stability, or closely implant is within the confines of the defect based on our study, and not just me, other people are finding out the same thing, that we can do immediate implant placement, bone grafting, tissue grafting, immediate tooth replacement, data has shown over and over again, minimally to no facial G2 recession. Okay. So now, but if the, oh, yep, stop, go ahead, Sasha. No, 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 that's good, that's good. So like, I think that's, um, that gives, I think, us a, a very good uh, comfort zone that basically, if you do the diagnostics correctly, and that's like, you know, clinical sounding and with combination with a cone beam CT scan. And I just want to add to this here, because both of us are working also in academic centers. Of course, CT scans are like abundant today in most clinical uh, scenarios. But, you know, uh, when you want to see like a little thin layer of bone, it's really important to have a good CT scan piece of equipment because, you know, uh, equipment A and equipment B might be completely different. So um, that's really important when you do these diagnostics that you have good equipment to diagnose the buccal bone. So Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Um, so then I will just kind of uh, flip the coin for a moment uh, and come from more from the non-immediate side. So just also to give you a comfort zone for those of you who are obviously are looking at this here. Remember, you don't want to push the immediate tooth replacement. That's really important, I think. And you have to remember that, like, you know, re reconstructing bone, when you have some facial bone missing with a combination graft, autogenous and xenograft with a native collagen membrane, seems to be really, really good for bone augmentation and contouring. So that really works well. And then, of course, we have a lot of research for many years that if you're missing some of the bone on the palate, so you have more like a vertical defect, we have a lot of good work there that the titanium reinforced PTFE membrane can reconstruct with GBR the vertical bone. So remember, immediate is one topic, but you know, feel comfortable to do it because you see the experience from uh, what you're presenting, Joe. But also, don't stress out because if it doesn't work, the diagnostically it doesn't have enough bone. We have protocols in place which work really well. Um, uh, one part of like you know, people always ask me like, hey. What do you do with the autogenous bone? Where do you get that from? Uh, especially patients always ask me. Well, you remember we have now these really nice, cute scrapers, and uh, we call them the meta scrapers. And they're like, you know, apically from the defect or laterally from the defect, we can always take some bone from that, like if we need to like harvest some of these GBR sites. So I think it's, it's, it's ensuring, and uh, I feel comfortable that you say this, because it's all based on diagnostics. When you diagnose it well, you have almost never a case that you can do, which is great. But, you know, we can also be comfortable if it doesn't work immediate. We have the backup, which is our GBR, which is great too. Okay. Uh, Joe, one more thing, and I think this will be our last question. You are a prosthodontist. So uh, we don't have so, many, so much time anymore, and pros, of course, is a completely different field, and you know, your aesthetic work is really um, 
always uh, inspiring and uh, outstanding for patients and for us to see. But I'm going to just give you a couple of questions and just tell me like, you know, A or B. So when you think about an abutment, right, that you want to place on an implant, are you going to go, when you do immediate tooth replacement, are you going to go for a temporary abutment or are you going to go and try to do a final abutment? Great question. Should we leave the abutment in by those one abutment, one time constant? Right. Uh, for me, uh, the, I usually, most, almost 100% of the time, that abutment I use for provisional is a, te is a temporary. That means I will eventually convert it into a definitive abutment. Why? Because most of the aesthetic, exclusive aesthetic cases, they really require abutment that has customization to it. And, and you know, why? at the time of surgery, it's hard to create a, I mean, make a, give an appointment to the patient that can customizingly fit the emergence profile for that patient. Therefore, for me, I always go customization now, but some people will challenge me. If you remove the appointment in and out a couple of times, like Ed Hansen had original published, you guys are having bone loss, you have all these things, right? But let me tell you. I mean, one of my graduate students, Dr. Chen, is actually doing a study on that right now, okay? And preliminary, I don't think, at least I asked her, I don't think there's much differences there. So, point is this, yes, it's always better to just do something and leave it in, okay? But the reality is, if you need to take it out a few times, at least clinically, absolutely irrelevant. At least under my hands, and I'm really critical. So, if... I see a problem by doing that, I would never go there. So for me, it's much easier for me to customize it so I can control the margins better in relationship to the you know, gingival. I can control the emergence profile better. That's why I tend not to go one appointment one, one time at the time of surgery, especially in the immediate impact situation. Now in the posterior area, okay, okay. If I really, if the referral source really want me to do that, I, I have no points. but. Aesthetic song, I prefer customization. Okay. And I'll tell you one, just like one comment, because I come more from a surgical side and you come more from a prosthetic side. Uh, for me, it's so easy as a surgeon to work with a prosthetic expert like yourself, because I don't worry so much about it. But when I start to work as a surgical expert with a restorative dentist who doesn't have as much experience, you know, this... Um, multiple insertion and removal I have seen does give problems so the one abutment one time concept I think is dependent again of course also on experience of the clinician and I've seen that with like referrals um, which have much less experience with uh, prosthodontics and restorative that like you know building in this like little barrier of protection of crestal bone seems to work really good for those patients so I just want to add this to our conversation. Next, next question, and we got to wrap it up in a few minutes, is um, give us your thought on immediate tooth replacement and of course do we cement carefully of course, we all know that cement rests are the kind of the, the, the tsunami of complications, or do you say you know what, no I don't cement at all even if I control it and I do all my cases uh, screw retained. Great question. For me, if I can, screw retain it always, without a doubt. And nowadays, the beauty about, from a restorative standpoint is, most companies, and even they have off-brand companies, that have what you call an angle channel abutment. And for those of you not familiar, it's like you can actually change the, the, the screw channel angulation to you know, from a non-screw retained position to make it into a more screw retained position. Of course, there are limitations. The compensation angulation is on an average for most companies around maximum 25 degrees. Okay. So in other words, as long as the surgeon plays an implant, oh. though it is not right at the middle of where you need the screw to be, access to be, as long as it is within 25 degree to that screw access, you know, Basically, we can utilize those prosthetic ankle channel components to change the ankle to make it into a screw retain. So, to put it in a nutshell, absolutely, if I can do screw retain 100% of the time, that's my goal. 
if I don't need to go back into school, see Mary Tain again, I mean, that's it. I'm done with that. So that's where I stand. Okay. Last question towards prosthetics and um, occlusion. And uh, positioning, of course, an anterior tooth in a protrusion. So, do you take all these immediate tooth replacements that you're doing and you're following up? Are they in infra occlusion, so absolutely no contact at all in occlusion and protrusion and lateral movement, or do you are you flexible on this here? And give us also like contact points. Okay, great question about occlusion. First of all, let me walk you through from. The, the, the provisional, during the immediate provisionalization healing phase, the way we occlusionally managed management is obviously different than with the definitive crown after the implant has been fully integrated. All right? So let me talk about doing provisionalization. Yeah, I, I'm mainly right. talking about provisionalization. Okay, perfect. During provisionalization stage, absolutely no contact eccentric nor eccentric, completely clean. And then usually some people say it will affect the aesthetics no it will not because you know as aesthetic will still look the same most of the aesthetic control from our cruiser controls on the lingual surfaces of that tube there so i make sure i clear out centric and eccentric completely free now one thing we gotta be very careful because if the patients are bruxer what do i do does that mean i don't put do, do immediate provisionalization i still do I clear the or clear all the centric eccentric occlusions. Not only that, I'll put the patient on some sort of like a occlusal duct. One last point: if the patient has parafunctional issues, one thing that we gotta be very careful because I often hear maybe you have heard too. You take implant placement, resort to dentist, put a provisional in there. They say, I swear, I clear all the centric. There's no touching, but yet the provisional keep coming loose or breaking. Why? And the patient say, I'm only eating soft diet. There's not, no biting on it. Well, let me tell you. There's one group of patient. So this is a central incisor. Let's say that's an implant. That's a mandibular teeth. So you clear centric. And when you go eccentric, it's clear, right? But the problem is that's one group of patients. You always need to double check. And you want to look at the patient's range of motion because how far do they move the jaw? Some, one group of patients, when they tell the patients to go protrusive, they will just shoot all the way out like that. Those are patients you got to be careful. Why? Okay. Because despite the fact that you clear centric and eccentric, but that's a third eccentric position. Most people, most restorative dentists fail to pay attention to. What is it? Pay attention now. The third position is when those are patients that can essentially move the jaw away, sometimes when they come back, suddenly, it snapped the tooth from the front. So you got to pay attention. So not only we got to pay attention to centric and eccentric clearance, but also the patient's range of movement of the jaw. If they are the type that shoot out, you got to be careful. When they snap back, will that be touching? If that is, make sure you clear that too. That's where I stand on. Okay. Okay, that's a great, um, um, you know, short answer actually for occlusion because occlusion is such a big topic. Um, and now I'm just looking for one number from you. One number, that's all you have to say. After you've placed an implant and you did a temporization on it, how long do you wait minimally before you go ahead and start making the custom final abutment and the final crown? How many months? So just give me one number. Four months. Four months. Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we can close this, please. There's a like button on this YouTube. If you like Dr. Joseph Khan, like it. If you like myself, like it. Um, Dr. Joseph Khan is very, uh, as you can see, passionate in his topic and uh, always love discussing with him. He's a very active presence on social media, on Instagram, on, on Facebook. So you can find him there under Dr. Joseph Khan. Of course, follow us uh, at uh, Guy Dental. I also have my own under Dr. Sasha Jovanovic. And um, we have, like, of course, many questions, as you can see. It's wonderful. Um, um, we want to appreciate the, also the, all of you who are coming from all over the world. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors who um, 
in this really difficult time where we do these all these webinars for free. Dr. Khan is giving his time. I'm giving my time. You're giving your time uh, to support us. Uh, that's really, uh, I think, admirable, and I want to appreciate them and uh, call them out, please. They need your support as well because obviously the offices are closed and they need you as well to come back to, uh, to talk to them. So please do. So from Los Angeles, from Southern California, um, Joseph, thank you. <laughs>